A printed scroll in the collection of Alma is typical in its enumeration of the contents of the Armenian Hamayil with following elements. Now, I was going to read all these, but they're actually all over there already. Uh, so, I'm not going to go through everything uh, that the scroll contains. I'll just mention a few things. There are essentially 32, 32 elements in my list. And here, 31 are, well, more or less the same. And since nobody here is planning to make one this evening, we don't really need to know. Uh, but there are a few important points to make. Scenes of Christ's life are always covered with pictures of our Lord. The creedal poem, Habadov Kostovanim, of St. Narcissus Shnor Havi, is almost always found. Uh, there's often a picture of the chalice and of uh, the consecrated bread, which have power over these demons. A prayer for binding of witches. A prayer to the Virgin Mary, Astvazadzin. A prayer to St. John the Baptist, or Garabed. Sometimes a prayer to St. Stephen the Proto-Martyr. Uh, various prayers of protection lists of the names of angels, sometimes prayer, prayers for headaches and eye aches. Usually in Armenian, the, the angels invoked for these, these illnesses are Saints of Cosmos and Damien. And they're also good at curing stomach aches. And this is a pan-Christian belief. Um, prayers against the evil eye. Uh, and texts that involve the invocation of multiple holy crosses, sometimes hundreds of them. And in this case, very often, the texts are arranged so as to form cross-hatching themselves. We'll see this presently, and you can see this in some of the examples on exhibit. A prayer of St. Gregory of Narek, used against demons, always very powerful. Um, prayers to the martial saints George, Sergius, and sometimes Theodore, usually those three, uh, and prayers for the bindings, uh, binding of Al's and Tubchas. Uh, the item concerning a list of holy crosses, other sacred shrines of Armenia, such as the Tuchman, this is a mysterious kind of chapel called the Black Youth of Folklore, is always produced in scrolls as a text crosshatched to make innumerable crosses very much like magic squares filled with numbers and symbols that appear in Armenian and other magical books. And you'll see analogs of this in outsider art. But I'd like to give an example of a Hamayil uh, with some of its more striking qualities. This is a uh, about as outsider art as you can get. The Hamayil comes from the Zokrab Center at the Armenian Diocese. It probably dates from the early 18th century. The first picture in it, please, is of an owl, and you notice it's holding the red lungs of its victim. Uh, then the next one, please. Christ and the cross. This is the exhibit of the, of the uh, manuscript. And it says here, Abot Bakban Tian, in a very, very curious mixture of Sheva gear and uh, Notar gear. But also you'll notice that around the Holy Cross there are astrological symbols, some of which are, are Muslim astrological symbols modified in Armenian texts, like that one up there, which is Mars. So here's the moon, here's Mars. This is the letter Ed, meaning he is, which is also the magical number seven, which is also a symbol of God. It translates Greek poem, the one who exists. Uh, and this is probably Venus. I don't know what the Da and Cha stand for. They could be numerical instead of 4 and 40. 40 is a magic number. Oh. But anyway, so this is not what you would usually expect to see around the cross, but it is a magical use of the cross. The next picture, please. Adam, Eve, and the serpent, considerably larger than either of them. And there is a fascination in Armenian art with the serpent. At Akhtamar, the serpent is really the hero of the scene. 
Uh, the next one. A saint vanishing a dragon. The dragon has two heads. Uh, the better to be trampled by the two, two hooves each of the horse. Um, next one. A magic square with mystical asemic symbols. Asemic means uh, symbols that have no intended meaning, that cannot be read. So they're not semiotic, but they still have some sort of effect. Uh, very often in Armenian texts, these symbols are based upon Arabic numbers, uh, sometimes on letters of the Armenian alphabet, and sometimes on God knows what. It's pretty obvious that this one, for example, is the letter J put on its side. Um, but the overall effect seems to be what's most important here. Um, the next one, please. Multiple cross-tatched crosses, holy crosses, uh, usually called Surf Nishan of whatever. Yeah? Uh, so this one, Sur, and then Nishim, which, which would be, um, well, it should be Nishani, but it doesn't matter. Skanchala boards, so on. Yeah. Um, and this is this is a typical example of Probably an inexpensive scroll, but one that gives us a very strong sense of the personality of its maker. And then we get, in the next picture, scrolls that were printed in the 19th century, where <coughs> the all this time looks a bit like a rather dapper Mephistopheles of the European Enlightenment, almost nonchalantly carrying his lungs here doing some sort of disco dance, it's quite something. Um, and it's, by this point, by the 19th century, the Armenian church had clearly made a kind of truce with magic, because uh, these things were not produced without the sanction of the church. Now before discussing the genre of outsider art in relation to this Armenian material I've introduced, I'd like to look at two important elements of these scrolls. The spells against the Al, which are the main purpose of the magician's work, and a text often used in magical prayers and sometimes found in scrolls as well, the story of the conversion of Cypriot of Antioch. A typical invocation against the Al from an Armenian scroll might read as follows. Solomon, why so the prince of the demons of darkness who roared like a cloud and screeched like a dragon? Solomon said, O oh, foul and accursed one, what are you? And then the demon explains uh, who he is, and Solomon imprisons him. Uh, then the three saints go outside. They went out hunting. They heard a child's cry. They saw the owl of her wickedness, seized her fast, told her, asked her what she did, and then spared her when she promised not to harm mothers any longer. These protective charms can be used in various ways. Uh, sometimes there are leaves of sacred texts folded into triangles and carried about on one's person. Sometimes they can even be dipped in water and drunk. But the main thing about a scroll as an object is its portability. First of all, uh, you see there, there are a number of cases that were made for them, and they were taken here and there by their owners. They could also be put under one's pillow, uh, and they were, and, or they could be unrolled and held against the body in order to protect all of it. And in ideal cases, a scroll was made to order, it was made the exact dimensions of the client's person. Yeah. And the scroll also has a kind of, what, kind of charisma, an air of antiquity. 